Hey, hey, it's Shay Keister, and I'm your host and the founder of Casual Cattle Conversations, a global rancher education company that strives to bring honest thoughts and conversations from ranchers and leaders to other ranchers. Be sure to follow Cattle Convos on social media to have more in-depth conversations around the ranching business and lifestyle brought to you. If you are ready to take your operation to the next level and improve your lifestyle too, send me a message about my Rancher Mind group. Rancher Minds are monthly roundtable discussions for ranchers to learn from peers and experts and leave the call with actionable advice to make changes on their own operations. With that, let's see who our guest is today and what experience and advice they have to offer you to improve your own operation. All righty. Well, Chad, thank you for hopping on the show today. I know we met at NCBA convention and had the opportunity to visit about all that you and your family are doing. I'm not going to explain that because that is your story. But to start off, would you please give my listeners a background on yourself and your family and kind of how you got started in the agriculture space? Because you weren't always in beef, if I remember correctly. Uh, that's correct. Uh, Amy and I actually started, uh, we will be married 30 years this year. Um, we actually started in the pig industry. Uh, I started in, in about 1993. Uh, Amy and I were married in 92. Uh, about 1993, I started with Iowa Select Farms, uh, Jeff Hansen. Um, I worked uh, in sow units and uh, kind of went, our, the first job I had was to fix a sow unit. And then the second one was to start up a sow unit and then start up another one. So my background's kind of starting up sow units. And after that, I went to Smith or went to Murphy's, which was bought by Smithfield and uh, was a territory manager for them uh, for about six years. And then we had built a site and uh, uh, about six years after, after we built the site, uh, we changed that over. Uh, Dr. Roger Main actually came to us and asked us if we switched over to a research facility. So we did research for another 12 years after that. Uh, anything from uh, space, uh, animal space trials to uh, uh, chemical castration to um, uh, vaccine to feed to, I mean, just, just a lot of different vaccines uh, or a lot of different uh, research projects. Um, and then, and then kind of after that, uh, uh, they decided to move the research kind of down to North Carolina. We were up to about 45,000 head of, of pig spaces at that time. Uh, our kids were graduating and we wanted to kind of diversify. And so we uh, decided to build a, a 320 foot hoop building and just do commercial, a commercial herd pretty much, a black Angus, semi cows, uh, we got Charlay bowls from Linscoves. Um, just going to make ma- mousy colored calves is what we we're going to do. And at that time, we kind of started to sell some of our hog sites. Uh, currently, today, we still have two sites uh, that pretty much house about 8,000 pigs. Um, but uh, uh, a guy by the name of uh, um, Austin Brandt came to us and said, hey, would you be interested in putting in some embryos? And so we decided to do that. Um, so that's kind of our background of how we started doing this. Um, and yeah, Amy grew up in Winterset, Iowa on a, uh, on a, uh, uh, a fat cattle, uh, uh, farm, I guess, uh, and, and farmed as well. Uh, I grew up on a farrow to finish operation, uh, right where I'm sitting today. And, uh, that's kind of, kind of how we got started. Well, awesome. And there are some other questions that I'll come back to about, you know, how it's helped you to work in multiple segments of agriculture. But for now, will you describe in a little more detail what your operation does look like today with your reset program? Yep. So today we roughly have about 1400 recips uh, and we are located 40 miles west of Des Moines, Iowa. I mean, we are flat, flat ground, black ground. I mean, ground selling for 16 to $18,000 an acre. Um, we can't find any pasture. That's the big thing. There just is no pasture. And to do what we do, it works very, very well to have those cows in hoop buildings because it's so easy to get them to a shoot. Um, so we have about 1,400 head of cows. All of our cows are in hoop buildings. Uh, uh, we do have uh, some in some outside lots. Um, 
but uh, that's kind of how it looks uh, here today. Uh, we've got two hoop buildings, uh, one 400 foot and one 320 foot. Uh, we are, we have the dirt work done for a third building, which is going to be 480 foot. Um, but that's kind of how our, our, uh, our system looks today. Uh, we calve all year round. Uh, like I said, my back, you're, you're going to hear a lot of pig analogy here. Um, we're not a spring and fall herd. I, I and I'm probably going to get some pushback on this. And, and, uh, as we talked at NCBA, um, uh, that's, that's fairly inefficient. Um, and I, I'm just saying, you got to think outside the box. And I, I think the cattle industry has got to change. Um, but we calve all year round. So we set up so many cap cows every week. Uh, we implant so many cows every week. We ultrasound so many cows every week. We calve out so many cow cows every week. Uh, and we, we, we move cows every week. Um, so it's more like a sow unit. What we have here is the, is the, 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 the farrowing rooms and the, and the breeding barn. And then at another facility, we have our gestation. So every week we have cows that move from our, our farrowing facility, breeding facility to our gestation facility. And then every week we have cows that are about ready to calve move to our, our, uh, our farrowing slash breeding facility. So that's kind of how our, our thing works. The hoop buildings are like a, uh, uh, they're, they're like a hammer, they're just a tool, okay? You can use them for several different things. You can calve in them, you can just, you know, have bulls in them, you can gestate in them, you can uh, uh, do replacement heifers. But the thing with those hoop buildings, they're just like a hammer. If, if you don't use it right, you're gonna hit your thumb, your thumb really hard and it's gonna hurt. And it's the same way with the with the uh, the hoop buildings. If you don't manage that tool right, it's really going to hurt. Um, and Amy, my wife, which she's not here today, but I'm I'm a firm. I'll get sued for this someday. I'm a firm believer that women do a much better job of raising anything than what men do. Okay, a uh, man will walk by some a, a calf and go, oh, we'll see how it, how it looks tomorrow. Women aren't like that. Amy. Um, uh, if there's something wrong, it's, it's at the shoot, like right now. Uh, we bed our buildings every day. It's got to be dry. You got to keep the udders clean. You've got to keep the navels clean. It, it's, it's no different than a farrowing facility. You've got to keep it dry. That's, that's your biggest enemy is, is wetness, and, and you got to keep it dry. So we scrape uh, the drover's alley every day and we bed every day. And if at four o'clock in the afternoon, it's wet, um, Amy's gonna have you out there bedding again. Um, that's just the way she rolls. Um, so you got it, you've got to use, use the building correctly. And I think, I think that that's why a lot of times these hoop buildings have gotten kind of a bad rap, um, but you've got to keep it dry. So you're doing a lot. There's a lot of moving cattle. There's a lot of bedding. There's um, a lot of handling cattle. Mm -hmm. what does that look like from a labor perspective? Like how much help do you have on your operation employees wise, even, even if that's family wise, how many people are there helping you day in and day out, make sure you're getting all this done. Yep. Uh, we have seven full-time people. Um, and I'd like to give a couple shout outs. Um, uh, Cole Steiner is our production manager. He manages all the cows, day-to-day uh, -day movement, uh, what cows go into what group, because uh, we're constantly moving groups by week. It's hard to, hard to, to explain, but he does all that. Without Cole, we, we wouldn't be where we're at. I'll just be very honest. Um, I do not pay him enough. Um, he, he just does a very, very good job. Amy takes care of all the calves. Um, I'm, I'm more of the global um, uh, thinker, I guess. Um, uh, Amy also does all the contracts. Uh, we do everything online through DocuSign. Uh, we don't take any checks. Um, all our payments are done online. Um, she, she does all that. So she's in charge of calves and, and those two things. Uh, uh, Blake Rutz works for us as well. Um, he does, he kind of does a lot of our processing, uh, also feeding, uh, maintenance, um, and, and whatnot. 
and then Clayton, my son, our son, um, takes care of, uh, of the pigs uh, and then also feeds in the morning uh, the cows and then does any processing that we need or, or he's kind of a floater, I guess. He helps do whatever. And we just hired a gal uh, from Iowa State, Bridget Holcomb. Uh, her dad's a, a vet from Winterset um, and she's coming on board and she will kind of uh, uh, um, be in a management role, uh, uh, looking over the calves, uh, kind of a shadow to Cole, understanding the process of how we work cows in, in the computer program and system. And we're kind of grooming her for, for system two. Uh, we, we will be building an, uh, a second system with another 1,400 cows uh, this summer, fall, and uh, we're grooming her possibly to manage that if she would like. Then we have five part-time uh, high school kids that come and work for us um, and, uh, and college kids that come and work. Wyatt Appleseth, he's been with us for four years uh, in the summers, uh, goes to South Dakota State, and, and, uh, and he, he works for us as well. So that's what we're, we're very fortunate. I know, I know everybody talks about the, the labor aspect of everything. We are very fortunate. I mean, we've got a great crew here um, and we are, we are looking at hiring more people. Like I said, we are going to do a site too. So if there's anybody here listening to it, looking for a job change, give me a call. <laughs> well, that's awesome. And then, I mean, very amazing that you are able to find the labor and have obviously implemented systems to keep them around and make them want to come back. Mm -hmm. So with that, one of the points that we had talked about in previous conversations is how you test the colostrum, correct? Mm -hmm. Of each yep. cow. Do you want to talk about that a little more and your purpose and process behind that? Yep. So here at Wilkerson Farms, we keep about um, between 40 and 50 KPIs um, in, a, in a sow unit KPIs or key production indicators. Um, and they're, they're a way to measure your business. Is, is one way of doing it, but also, again, my background is research uh, of owning the research facility, and we have hired a part-time statistician to work for us, um, just on a contract basis, Matt Wolflick's his name, um, and he's actually doing all that compiling of the data, um, but we're, uh, we're doing things uh, on, the, on the data side as, as conception rate um, by bull, uh, by donor, uh, by time of year, by who made the, the, the embryo, whether it's Transova, Vitelli, because we are, we are a, a private company. We are not bound by Transova, uh, Vitelli, Bovatech, anybody. We're our own being. Um, so we're compiling that data, whether it's fresh or frozen, uh, IVF conventional. I mean, we can go through all that. But one thing that we're doing that's kind of new in the beef industry, we really don't know what colostrum does. In the dairy industry, we do. We know exactly what, what the colostrum does um, and what levels you need to be at. Um, so what we started doing here about, oh, it's probably been about four or five months ago. Uh, like I said, it's very easy to do because all of our cows are in hoop buildings. Um, so after a cow calves, uh, within 20 minutes, we bring that cow into our chute we make sure all four quarters are, are open and good. We, we record that. We take a colostrum sample. We also have a refractometer and, uh, and a centrifuge. And uh, so that cow gets, gets a colostrum sample. Then we take it in and we, we put it in the refractometer and we take a colostrum sample. And if it's under 22.5 on the brick scale, we supplement that calf with colostrum. And we, we record that. And, um, and then uh, 48, 48 hours later, we, we bleed that calf, and then we do a, a passive transfer test on that calf as well to see how much of that colostrum actually it was, that calf it, uh, absorbed. And so uh, we record all that information as well. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that information in time. We haven't got enough data points yet to make any, in, any you know, thought of, of of what we how we need to go forward but we're going to take that information and then we're going to we're going to lay it back on our our treatment cost to see if okay if a colostrum's under 25 does our treatment cost go up compared to if it's if it's 28 our treatment cost is 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 very minimal so you know that's all that's all data that we're keeping here um 
uh, we're, we're trying, like I tell everybody, we're trying to be the Marriott, not the Motel 6. Um, I mean, we're a 24 hour facility. Um, so we're trying to do things that, um, uh, and capture data that, that other operations just can't do. So. Well, that's really neat. And I really like how you are, you know, bringing in those KPIs and capturing that data and bringing that into the beef side. And so you've talked about it a lot. So I'm going to shift in that direction, but that would be, you know, what are the main differences when you look at your background in swine production and beef production and really what, how do you want the beef industry to change after being involved in both sides? So I, I'm, I'm probably going to, I don't know if we can cuss on here, but probably going to piss some people off by saying this. Um, I speak quite a bit uh, uh, in Nebraska. I was just over at a, in Blair speaking to a uh, cattleman's banquet and I just spoke at Iowa State and I sometimes like to just smack people right in the mouth right when I get up there. And, and one of my comments is um, the beef industry is the last protein industry to become efficient. And that's probably going to make people scratch their head a little bit. But if you really think about it, it's true. Um, if you look at all the other protein industries, I don't count sheep, sheep and goats in this because I just don't. Um, that's a whole nother industry in itself. Um, but if you look at fish, turkeys, chicken, pork, dairy, what do all those have in common? They've went to a systems approach a system production approach to what they do. Uh, they measure data like there's no other, okay? And I'm not saying you have to do this, but they've, they've brought their production system inside. I don't think you have to do that in, in the beef industry, but I think there's some, there's some players out there that are gonna force us to change. And I hate to tell you, it's not the packing industry. It's not. There are some players coming down, down the pike that are going to be bigger than the pack, Packers. Okay. They're going to force the Packers to change, which is going to force us to change. Okay. Very, if you look at variability on the, on the, on the beef side, if you look at a ruler, we're at, we're at 12 inches when it comes to variability. Okay. Uh, turkeys and chickens are about a half an inch on variability. Pigs are probably about an inch and a half. Um, I, I think the variability of carcass and quality, especially carcass size would be the bigger one. Uh, the variability of that in the packing is, is going to make, uh, is, is going to make us change. We just, I think we just have too much variability compared to the other protein industries. That's my own opinion. And you I, know appreciate, they, you know, I appreciate you, know they, you sharing that. You know what they say about, about opinions. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I mean, that's, that's part of the reason I have this show is to share different thoughts and opinions and make people think. And there's a lot of truth to what you said. And I mean, there's always things we need to be thinking about and uh, making sure we can't do things better. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Yep. So really, okay, so I'm going to, flop back now, back to the ET side. When you first started with embryo transfer work and getting involved in that space, what were some of the main hurdles you faced? Uh, we had two main hurdles. Um, well, three, and it's amazing. It, it's kind of weird how you, how you, as you go forward, there's different hurdles. Um, because we, we don't have any pasture and we run a TMR all the time with, with, uh, uh, with and we don't feed any hay. That's another thing. I, I don't have a bale of hay on the property. We feed corn stalks, uh, DDGs, uh, uh, corn, uh, corn silage, um, some soy hole pellets um, and a liquid protein. But at, when we first started, we, we weren't feeding a toxin binder. And we had some problems with some conception rates. Uh, and working with Zach McCracken from Soothers, um, 
we, we found out that we needed to use a toxin binder. And as soon as we started using that, our conception rate went right back, went right back up. Uh, another one was water. If you're on a well, please check your water. It's like 18 bucks. I mean, it's not a huge deal. I mean, I spend more than that on a Friday night on things I probably shouldn't. Um, make sure your sulfur level in your water is, is low. Um, we had a problem um, with some sulfur in our water uh, and our conception rate kind of went down. Uh, we went to all of our customers, told them what was going on and, and refunded a lot of money. Um, we wanted to make sure we were very truthful on that. Um, so those were two constraints we had. Now we're getting to the point where we're growing so fast and it's, and believe me, I'm going to say this and everybody's going to go, yeah, I totally understand what you mean, but capital finding capital out there. Uh, we're working with several, several VCs on, on expansion um, and uh, uh, it's going very well, but uh, you got to find partners if you're going to expand this fast. So. Well, thank you for sharing that. So what would be your advice for anyone trying to get into the embryo transfer space, whether that's they want to flush their own cows or they want to develop a recip herd? I mean, those are two different ends of it, but what advice do you have for people who want to enter this space of the beef industry? In, in my opinion, the, and I know I'm in the business, but I'll, I'll walk you through my thought process. I think embryo transfer is, is, is the future of the beef industry. Um, there's a few companies out there working on um, a terminal beef, uh, which means, uh, you know, they're going to get a, a commercial donor um, or a, a donor uh, and a sire, and uh, they're going to put them in a recip. And, and those, those calves are going to go directly to the feedlot. Um, in my opinion, I think in the future, that's how you lower that variability that I just got done talking about. Um, and I think that company pretty much understands, well, I know they do, we've had conversations, but um, that company understands where they're going. Um, so I think embryo transfer is something that, that is, is going to be the future. It's, it's kind of, it's no different than the AIing in the seventies. Okay. It's the future. We just got to figure out how to make it more efficient. And we've done that. I mean, if you look at AI in the seventies compared to where we're at now, I mean, we're much better than we were. I think, I think, you know, your 42% conception rate average on, on, on embryos, uh, I think in the next, you know, 10 years is probably going to probably be at 60 if we, if we can figure more and more out. Um, but I, I think on that side, yes, I, I think that's, that's the future uh, of the beef industry, in my opinion. Um, I do believe uh, if you want to get into the business that I'm in, uh, as in doing embryo transfer, number one, you better have a lot of capital uh, or partners to do it. You've got to have a system, which we've pretty much figured out. Um, and uh, you'd better be ready to not sleep very much. Uh, there, there's just a lot of responsibility when you, I mean, there's calves out here that haven't even, haven't even been born yet that were sold on a sale three months ago. So there's just a little bit of, of uh, stress when it comes to that kind of stuff. So, um, and we've got, I mean, we've already got people that have put their, their, their money down on, on, uh, on spots a year from now. I mean, the demand is there, but uh, just from experience, if you're thinking about just doing a spring herd or just doing a, a spring and fall herd and you're going to implement uh, or do, uh, do a reset business. Um, you're going to struggle with efficiency. So, well, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, you've hit any other question I was going to ask and other responses. So as we wrap up today, do you have any final thoughts or messages you want to share with my audience? Yep. We are, uh, <clears throat> we have announced a, a new program um, that we have, uh, we are looking for partners, um, with 300 head or more. Um, <clears throat> and I, I, I haven't quite figured out how, how, what radius we need to do, but if you have 300 head or more cows, we would, uh, be interested in a partnership in which 
we would bring your cows into our program and all you would do is gestate. Um, we would calve them out here, uh, put embryos in them, get them bred, and then we would ship them back to you. Um, it's a five-year agreement. Uh, and you can sell your bulls. You can, um, no creep feed, no lactation feed. Uh, you don't have to get up at two o'clock in the morning, pull a calf. Um, uh, no replacement cost. Um, there's just a lot of, a, a lot of positives to it. And, uh, and you will, you will make the same amount as if you were calving out yourself. So uh, if you're interested in that, please give us a call. We'd be more than happy to talk to you about it. Um, like I said, we're located in central Iowa. I don't think I'm probably interested in somebody in Nevada or North Dakota, but, uh, but uh, if you're, if you're somewhat close, we'd be interested in talking. So. Well, where can they, is there a website or um, should I put your contact information in the show notes? How can they reach out to you, Chad? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> we do have a website. It's wilkersonfarms.net. And then uh, you can visit our Facebook. Uh, there's a number on there as well. It's just Wilkerson Farms. Or you can get a hold of me directly at 641-757-9511. Well, awesome. Thank you very much for hopping on the show today and sharing your story and thoughts about the future of the beef industry. I really appreciate it. Well, I'm, I'm sorry it took so long to, to get together, but I, I certainly appreciate you asking us. And that's a wrap on that one. Be sure to let me know your thoughts on the episode. And if you have any further questions around the topic, take care and have a great day.